The truth needs reinforcements. Um, in 2015, a really good friend of mine called me. He's a guy who um, manages money for rich people in Canada. And he's a very smart guy, deeply read, um, probably center left in his politics, totally reasonable. And he called me full of outrage because he had just read a story about how Barack Obama's mother-in-law was being paid a, um, a, a federal pension of $200,000 a year for babysitting um, the Obama children in the White House. And he just thought this was an outrage. And I said to him, Doug, you know, that, that sounds a little weird. W where did you get this from? And he said, oh, no, I, I read it. I re I've got it right here. I'll send it to you. And he sent me the link. And it was a link to a publication called the, the BostonTribune.com. Now, as you know, I'm from Boston. I know Boston. They'd never heard of a BostonTribune.com. And sure enough, it didn't really exist. It was fake. It was one of these click farms made by teenagers in Macedonia. But it totally fooled an otherwise smart, intelligent, well-read, connected person. The truth needs reinforcements. I'm going to tell you about my summer project. My summer project is I've been following a little company in Toronto, as it is, a little startup machine learning artificial intelligence company that's trying to perfect what we now know as deep fakes. These are videos that can make it seem like you are doing and saying things that you actually never said or did. It's using machine learning and AI technology to create videos, video images of people saying and doing things that they never said or did. And I've been following this company all summer long because they're trying to be the first company in the world to create the perfect deepfake, which would take my face and my voice and create a complete replica of me where they could then just type whatever they wanted to type and make me say or do whatever they want. I didn't really grasp the importance of this until the day I arrived and they had managed to create a deep fake version of David Attenborough's voice, one of the most recognizable voices in the world. We all love David Attenborough's voice, don't we? <laughs> and they played it to me and I was like, I, that's David Attenborough. Nope, it's not. So uh, let me let me let me take a spin at the let me take a spin at this and let me see if you're really if this is the real deal. And they gave me a laptop and they let me write whatever I wanted to write. And they basically gave me the power to make David Attenborough say whatever I wanted David Attenborough to say. So naturally, because I was in Toronto, the hometown of the friend that I was just telling you about. I decided to make David Attenborough solve a football bet that I've been having with my friend for 20 years. We've been arguing about who's a better quarterback, Brett Favre or Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> I say Brett Favre, he says Aaron Rodgers. We all have different feelings. I know, I'm sorry, it's true. But there I am having David Attenborough say the following sentence. In nature, there are lions and there are pussycats. Brett Favre is a lion. Aaron Rodgers is a pussycat. <laughs> and it's kind of a crazy thing to have the power to make one of the world's most famous voices say whatever you want that person to say. 
and because I'm in a room of public policy wonks, think about what that could do to our political discourse. But I want to even get it more personal here, because I asked these brainiacs to do a deep fake of my voice. And they did. They gave me six samples of my voice. Three were fake and three were real. And my wife, who's sitting here right now, along with my two children, I played it for them. I made them all take out a piece of paper and score true or false on each of the six samples of my voice. We played them one after the other, and the voices, my voice and my real voice, they couldn't tell the difference between what was real and what was fake. Some, my son said, oh, that's fake. My daughter said, oh, that's real. It was astonishing. And it's actually an incredibly vulnerable feeling to know now that seeing is no longer believing. Hearing is no longer believing. This is gonna present a profound challenge to the idea of what's real and what's fake, what can we trust. The truth needs reinforcements. Recently, Facebook announced that it was going to run political ads knowing that those political ads had outright falsehoods in them. The most amazing device that we have created to disseminate information is now in the business of disseminating information in political campaigns that they know is false. We all have this experience. We were just talking about it at dinner, where you're, we're all, we have our Twitter feeds, and we're just bombarded with story after story, item after item, and it's so fast, it's so rapid, it's really difficult for even the most discerning reader to know the difference between what's real and what's fake, what's true, what's a lie. And the fact that the social media platforms are so embedded in distributing all of this media and now knowingly, willingly, deliberately making a decision to use their platforms to distribute lies. The truth needs reinforcements. My last big story for the New York Times was about one simple question. How did Donald Trump get rich? And Donald Trump has told everybody over and over the same story. I got a single loan from my dad of $1 million, and I parlayed that into an empire worth $10 billion. So that over and over, probably many of you in this room have heard it a million times. So it turns out he was off by $413 million. <laughs> we labored for 18 months, and we were able to document 295 distinct methods that Fred Trump used to enrich Donald Trump. Donald Trump was making today's equivalent of $200,000 a year when he was three years old. By the time he was nine, he was a millionaire. By the time he was 17, he had ownership of his first large apartment complex in New York City. Fred Trump paid his son to be his apartment manager, to be his landlord, to be his banker, to be his consultant, to be his stockbroker. He even gave him the revenue from the laundries 
that were in the basements of his buildings. The nickels, the quarters, the, all of that. He didn't just give his son one loan, he gave him dozens of loans, and these are the best kind of loans you can get. You don't have to pay them back, and there's no interest. <laughs> Donald Trump did something over and over and over again throughout his career. He would take reporters with him on a tour of New York City. He would take them in his limousine with the license plate DJT, chauffeur, and he would take them on a tour of New York City to point out his buildings. Here's this building here. Here's a building in Staten Island. Here's a building in Brooklyn. Spend the whole day driving the city, pointing out his buildings. The truth was he actually didn't own a single one of those buildings. His father owned them entirely. He had no ownership interest in them whatsoever. He would have, he would actually pose as his own spokesperson and adopt an alias and call the reporters who were making the rich list of wealthiest Americans. And he would call up these reporters, who were usually younger reporters who were tasked with this, this, this project of making the 100 wealthiest Americans, or whatever it was, 500 richest Americans. And he would call them up and he'd say, I'm here, I'm calling on behalf of Donald Trump. You have him way too low on the list. He really is much higher. He should be much, much higher. Here, here are the assets that you have failed to count. And the reporters didn't even really compute the notion that someone could take them on a tour and point out building after building after building and simply lie. They couldn't compute the fact that actually, if you looked closely enough, the car was purchased by his father. The limousine driver was paid by his father. But none of that, none of that seeped in to the early coverage of Donald Trump. When we were working on this project, we had a whiteboard in our conference room where we would scribble down thoughts, observations, questions, and one day I went to the board and I wrote across the top what I thought actually should be the, the headline of our story, the correction, the correction. The truth desperately needs reinforcements. After the Deepwater Horizon oil rig blew up in the Gulf of Mexico, I went down to cover the Coast Guard hearings where they were trying to figure out what went wrong. And it was in a hotel conference room, probably three times the size of this room. And, um, and there was a little section in the corner, kind of over here, where they had room for the reporters who were covering this hearing. Now this, as you all know, was in a monumentally large story that had huge implications to communities all along the Gulf Coast and in, in, in. What really stunned me the first time I walked in to the conference room was that there were only four or five reporters there. The rest of the room, whole rows, filled with public relations people who worked for BP and Halliburton and the company that made the blowout preventer, the company that made the cement that went into the well, the company that made the boats that took the cement that went in the well. There was dozens and dozens and dozens of PR people. And every time I would walk out of the conference room, they would attack me like piranhas. They would just swarm me. 
And he'd be like, the Halliburton would be like, it's all Transocean's fault. Transocean's, it's all BP's fault. We've got to pull you aside here and give you the documents that are going to prove that it's actually the cement guy's fault. And it was this incredible mismatch that really reflects something quite deep and profound about what's happened in journalism over the last 20 years. And that is the muscle of truth seeking, the muscle of reporting, has been decimated, has been laid waste by the economic problems of the industry that we're all so familiar with. Tens of thousands of reporters have been laid off from small, medium, and large news organizations. And it's been happening, and there's still no end really in sight. But at the same time as the muscle of truth-seeking has been weakened, the muscle of spin is on steroids. Schools, journalism schools, are increasingly turning to teaching marketing classes. They're teaching public relations classes. They're teaching strategic communications because that's where the jobs are. There's been this steady erosion of just the simple idea of teaching pure journalism. The school that I went to, Northwestern, it used to be the Medill School of Journalism. Now it's the Medill School of Journalism and Integrated Marketing. The truth needs reinforcements. And this is all just a really long way for me to explain why I have come to Berkeley. I came here to preach. <laughs> I came here to proselytize. I came here to proselytize my religion, the religion of investigative reporting, to teach students about my saints, St. Robert Caro, St. Catherine Boo, St. Ida Tarbell, I came here to preach. I came here to find recruits for truth. And luckily, when I came here, I found the most amazing partner in proselytizing, and that is Professor Gita Anand, who is sitting right down here. Please, Gita, please stand. Gita is also one of the best investigative reporters on planet Earth. She's in the Pulitzer Club and many other wonderful clubs. And the two of us together have been doing everything we can to sucker as many smart young people as possible into a life of investigative reporting. What we're trying to do is we're trying to teach these incredibly smart, passionate, ambitious, sometimes angry young people everything we possibly can about what it takes to do great investigative reporting, what it takes, what goes into it. Because as all of you philosophy majors know, the truth is hard. The truth is a really squiggly little beast. And putting your hands on it, defining it, describing it, telling stories about it, takes a profound commitment, an intellectual commitment, a commitment of curiosity, 
a commitment of being relentless about questioning your own assumptions, about reporting against your own sources, reporting against your own hypothesis, a deep commitment to embracing gray, to embracing nuance, to being not just satisfied to get the facts right, but being absolutely, utterly determined to also get the context correct. It's brutally hard work. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to pull as many young people as possible into taking up the torch of investigative reporting because the contest, I think, that we're in truly is a contest between a world of truth, a world of verifiable fact, a world where one plus one equals two, and a kingdom of lies where one plus one equals whatever the people in power want it to add up to, where the people who are doing their level best to seek truth, to speak truth, are labeled as traitors, as enemies of the people, where people who ought to know better political leaders, business leaders, they speak nonsense. It's so difficult to excavate truth from underneath a mountain of lies. John Carreyou spent months and months and months of dogged reporting aided by very courageous whistleblowers to dig beneath the mountain of lies and to expose the incredible fraud at the heart of a Silicon Valley darling, Theranos. This isn't just about politics. There's a rot that is creeping deeper into our society. Harvey Weinstein, he caged the truth behind a mountain of non-disclosure agreements, aided and abetted by some of the best lawyers that money can buy, and some of the best spinmeisters money can buy. Megan Toohey and Jody Cantor and Ronan Farrow, this story was buried under a mountain of lies for years. And it took a massive effort, months and months of work, in the face of ferocious pressure, economic threats, legal threats, in order to actually excavate the truth of what that man did. Those are success stories. Those are success stories that we celebrate. Think of how many other stories end in a different way. The truth needs reinforcements. That's why I came to Berkeley. And that's why I'm very honored to be here tonight. And I'm happy to take any questions, any complaints, <laughs> any comments whatsoever. Yes, I saw a hand go up there. Um, I'm wondering how, I guess worried is the word I'm thinking about. Students are or need to be made aware of the dangers lurking for them in their future as reporters. I look at the countries where reporters are 
killed because they're reporters. I look at the countries where hundreds over time of reporters are currently imprisoned. Um, and the numbers are intimidating to those of us who are not journalism students who are committed to the truth. I'm wondering if you have any response to that. I, Thank you. I, I have to say, so um, um, not long before I left the New York Times, this isn't why I left the New York Times, but not long before I left, we were forced to put up big cement blocks in front of each of the entrances to our building. We were forced to do so because of the threat level and the, the threats that have been pouring in. All of us who do this kind of work, we're used to getting threats. But I can tell you that in recent years, the tenor of those threats has really shifted. It's not just like, I'm gonna sue you, I'm gonna put you out of business. The threats that come in are much more personal. I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna kill your family, I'm gonna kill your colleagues, you're vermin. You, can, you hear this, this thing in the voices when they leave voicemails. There is a level of rage in this belief underneath that, which is you are engaged by definition, if you work at the New York Times, you are engaged in deliberately spreading lies in order to destroy the United States of America. That's, 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 it's that simple. This morning, I arrived at the investigative reporting program headquarters on Hearst Avenue. Someone smashed the front door last night. They broke in and four of our computers were stolen. We don't know what happened or why or what the motive is. We did just publish a story this weekend that described for the first time in the most authoritative way that's ever been done in California, over 600 police officers who were convicted of crimes, including dozens and dozens of them who remain on the job today. We don't know what happened, but I can tell you my staff is shaken because we live in this world. We live in this, under this, this atmosphere. Now I will say there's a flip side to the atmosphere, which is in the same way there's this kind of ugly tenor to the comments and the threats, Well, let me tell you the best story I can tell you about this. I was on an airplane, and there was a man sitting next to me with a very antsy four-year-old boy, and I was doing everything I could to help him distract this young man. And so eventually he asked me, what do you do? And I said, I'm a reporter for the New York Times. And he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, thank you so much. People, it's an interesting thing. When you tell people what kind of work you do, there's a sort of a flip of the coin. Sometimes it's not so great, but sometimes what I'm noticing is that people actually wanna put their hands on you and say thank you. They put their hands on your shoulder and they say thank you. And that's different too, and that's interesting to me. Yes. investigative reporter or reporters need to get their facts straight. Yes. But they also need to get the context right. Correct. And I'm not sure what the difference is. Isn't the context just more facts? You can write a story that is factually unassailable and completely wrong. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of a good example, and maybe my mind's going to, it'll come to me later. 
maybe you're right. I think you're probably right. Context in some cases is simply getting more facts that help then you see the facts that you already have in a different light. That maybe is exactly what I'm talking about. There's this fear that we have that we have lots of facts, but what we don't know, if we knew it, would make us see something in a different light. That's the, that's the thing that frightens me the most when I'm about to, when I'm about to do, uh, when I'm about to publish a story. That's the thing that I actually worry about the most, is the thing that I fact check the most, and the thing that I'm thinking about. And what I'm trying to do is come up with, a, with an approach to investigative reporting that from the very early stages, the entire approach is designed to counteract the possibility that something like that will happen. It means this kind of constant searching to peel back another layer of the onion. You, sometimes it's, a, it's, a, it's an impossible task. You never really ever feel like you're all the way there. But you have to at least do your best. And then you have to do your best to actually tell your story. And this is part of the craft. It's part of the difficulty of doing great investigative reporting. It's not enough to put your hands on the truth. You also have to be able to present that, to present that story in a way that is clear and compelling. And I'm so sorry it was a long slog for you, but, but, um, but I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to tell stories in ways that are credible and that readers, no matter where they are on the political spectrum, whatever else they might think about the story, the one thing I hope that they don't have to worry about is that this is made up. So I focus a lot on attribution, careful attribution, on the record attribution. I focus a lot on making as much of our homework available to the reader, so linking to original source documents underneath. I focus a lot on writing stories in ways where you're avoiding the wiggle words, the many's, the sums, the abouts, and instead I try to write with precision, a kind of precision that can allow someone to contest and say, no, that fact is wrong. I focus a lot on, people often ask me this question, you, you, you spend so much time on these stories, don't you worry that there's a whole segment of the population that won't even read the first sentence? They will dismiss it out of hand. What do you do about them? And what I actually do is I do everything humanly possible to try to reach every single one of them. I'm not gonna give up. I'm not gonna just write them off. I'm gonna take that as a challenge to become a better investigative storyteller, and I'm gonna take it as a challenge to do my work in a way that shows exactly how I know what I know, exactly how I'm saying what I'm saying, and backs it up with on-the-record facts, sources, documents, I'm not going to give up. Yeah. Sorry. Um, there was an article today in the New York Times about your alma mater, oh. actually. Yes. Well, that's just, forget investigative reporting. Let's just say all reporting, <laughs> okay? Um, that was a, a really disturbing situation and deeply troubling to every journalist that I know. Basically what happened, if, for those of you who don't know the story, at least as I understand it, and I haven't studied it in depth, so if I get something wrong, 
take that. Um, uh, it's because I'm just speaking based on what little I've read so far. But what I do understand is that there was a protest. Jeff Sessions was coming to give a speech at Northwestern University, and a group of students wanted to protest him coming to give that speech. And the Daily Northwestern covered not just the speech, but they also covered the protest outside of the speech. And as part of that coverage, they took photographs of the protesters who were protesting in a public space this particular speech. But that basic reporting act of taking pictures of a public protest enraged a number of the students who were involved in the protest. And what further enraged them was that the Daily Northwestern, seeking to get comment, did the basic reporting step of trying to figure out who some of these students were, searching social media and other publicly available sites in order to identify them and call them up and ask them why they were there protesting. This is reporting 101. And yet, a number of students, a significant number of students, were so outraged at this simple act of reporting that they began heaping abuse on the editors of the newspaper, saying that you were traumatizing them by putting their picture in the paper, by calling them up, you were invading their privacy. And it was so bad that the editors of the Daily Northwestern wrote a note to the public, I believe yesterday, and actually apologized for doing this basic reporting. This is deeply disturbing. It's deeply disturbing because it shows a kind of profound resistance to some, this isn't investigative reporting. Covering a protest is not investigative reporting. Covering a protest is just reporting. And the fact that a group of students, a significant number of students, didn't actually get that and took issue with that is also a profound threat to the idea of seeking truth and describing the world as it is. Yes. Thank you. I wonder if you could speak to the economics of investigative reporting. Some of the time, your stories take a year to develop, sometimes more, with papers laying off journalists. Um, has investigative reporting just now centered on things like the Center for Investigative Reporting? Most newspapers can't afford to do it. I'd like to hear more on that, please. It's a great question and a really profoundly important one, too. Um, the economics of investigative reporting are insane, okay? So someone like me, I spend a year, 18 months, two years sometimes, trying to write these stories, these kinds of stories that really penetrate the subject matter at hand. There's not just my salary, there's lots of travel. It's very easy for a major investigative project at a, at, a, at a place like the New York Times or the Washington Post to easily cost upwards of a million dollars for one story. So economics of investigative reporting are insane. However, there's a good side to this, and that is, Investigative reporting done well, done right, done correctly, done compellingly. One of the things we can see is we see an enormous public appetite for stories of substance, stories that are told with great craft and great integrity. And those stories end up actually when they're done well and they're done right and they're not always done well and they're not always done right, but when they are, they really solidify the relationship between the audience and the news organization. We can see it, we actually see it. You can now see it obviously in all the metrics that we're, we're all swimming in. You can actually see, I remember the day that we published the Trump tax story and I was standing there in the middle of the newsroom and we were all huddled around a computer where we could see a clock counting the number of readers in the first 10 seconds, in the first 30 seconds. And you could just see
see this meter. And then one of the editors said, oh, you think this is something. I'm about to send out an alert. Watch what happens now. And he pressed a button, and out went a New York Times alert to all your cell phones in here. And you all like, oh, and the numbers just by the end of the first week after that story, the thing, the metric that I look for has nothing to do with numbers. The metric that I look to to figure out whether or not a story that I've worked on has permeated the culture, what I look to is I look to the late night comedy shows. <laughs> and by the end of the week, every single late night comedy show had done a hilarious bit on this particular show. And of course, it always culminates with Saturday Night Live. And that's when you know, when you hit them all, that's when you know your story is really sinking in. But the, but the economics of investigative reporting has required new models for financing investigative reporting. Part of that model are, is the nonprofit model the one that we all know about probably, I hope you all know about it here, is ProPublica, which has been largely financed through donations from foundations and others. And they have become an astonishingly good source of investigative reporting. Same with CIR, right down the street here. And quite frankly, the investigative reporting program at Berkeley, one of the reasons why I'm here, is because I'm interested in experimenting with it too as a potential new model for financing the expensive costs of doing great investigative reporting. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring in support from donors, from foundations. We're also trying to actually generate commercial revenue by actually selling our stories to major media outlets. So we have a six-part series that will be running on Netflix in February that involved students being part of that process. And that brings in commercial revenue along with donations. And that then comes into the program and helps us then send students out to do real, honest-to-God, investigative digging. One of the stories that ran with our project this weekend about uh, cops with criminal records was done by two of my students. And they went to a town in California, McFarland, California. And they found at this particular police department, almost all of the police officers were hired, even though the people who hired them knew that they had criminal records. And these were like some pretty serious criminal records. Those students went back to that town 14 times. We spent $25,000 sending them back to that town over and over and over again so that they could actually nail that story cold. And they did. They did. So that's kind of what we're trying to do, is see if we too can be part of creating a new economic model that helps support investigative reporting. One of the things that is so frightening to me is that the basic media ecosystem that created me, that ecosystem has totally broken down. That ecosystem was an ecosystem where someone like me got hired pretty quickly at a small newspaper. I wrote a bunch of investigative projects in my first couple of years. They were all terrible, but they all taught me something. And then I went to a medium-sized newspaper. I wrote more investigative projects. Some were terrible, some were getting better. I was beginning to actually find my voice, figure out what kind of voice I had as a writer, and I was also beginning to discover what worked best for me as a reporter, trial and error. I didn't get to the New York Times until I was 35 years old. And I thank God 
that I didn't get there sooner. Because by the time I got there, I was ready. I had been trained. That media ecosystem is totally broken down. Local newspapers, as we all know, many of them are disappearing outright. Medium newspapers, many of them are disappearing outright. Brutal cost cutting, brutal layoffs, reporters being laid off. And so that ecosystem that allowed someone like me to take my baby steps into investigative reporting no longer exists. One of the things we are trying to do here at the investigative reporting program is we're trying to address that very problem. We're trying to take the two years that we have these students and we're trying to give them hands-on experience, not just hearing me lecture in a boring way about how I do what I do, but actually having them take on substantive, important, investigative reporting projects in print, in documentary, in this thing called podcasts. I'm actually trying to challenge my students to be the first to figure out how to do a great investigative project on Instagram. Wouldn't that be something if we could figure that out? Think of who we could reach if we could figure that out. We're trying to also experiment with new forms of investigative storytelling. We're trying to experiment with data and data analytics, data science. These students are something else. And they basically are saying, you know what? Don't tell us that we need to spend 20 years paying our dues. What they're saying is, coach, put me in. They're challenging us. Coach, put me in. And I've told this story before. It's a big part of why I'm placing this bet on this place. And it has, to do with, has nothing to do with journalism whatsoever. It has to do with those kids from Parkland. After that shooting occurred in Parkland, I was just astonished watching these high school students at the worst moment of their lives conduct themselves with this kind of amazing poise and focus and intention. They weren't intimidated by the big shots in New York coming down to interview them. They weren't going to be bullied by the NRA or any other group that was trying to silence them. There's something about this generation, and we're trying to tap into that. We're trying to do what we can to say, okay, you want to get in the game? We're going to put you in.